Hi everybody, I almost said good evening because it's evening where I am, but wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for watching. This is my first session at Theonas that I'm doing in the year 2022. And I want to thank all the guest speakers that we had, uh, Marty from all the way from New Zealand who spoke, and then Apostle Lewis from Chicago, Pastor Ayo from London, and then my good friend Dirk from right here that spoke about relationships. He spoke last week. So um, you guys can still watch those messages that are on our YouTube channel. As for me, um, it's the end of January, end of the first month of 2022, and I'm starting my series. Um, and I'm starting a series called When I Wake Into Eternity. And the series is going to be about eternity. It's going to be about heaven. And it's going to be about all the things that the Bible says about heaven. Now, unfortunately, I haven't been to heaven. So for those of you who think this is a session of somebody that died and went to heaven, it's not. Um, I'm going to use scripture, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay. Okay, so uh, when I wake into eternity, a few things you guys can do to help this ministry go th for forward. I will say forward. I've been watching a lot of Marvel movies uh, recently. Forward. <laughs> I got hammered, but not in an ungodly way. <laughs> Thor is a hammer for those of you guys who don't know. Thank you, Thor the hammer. A um, few, few things you guys can do to help us go forward. Um, number one, you can contribute financially. Why do I say that's number one? Because with, with, without money, we cannot do this. So... Um, if you if you if you like watching like the all they want is my money um it's not all we want <laughs> but it's one of the things we want it really helps us to go forward um and i know if you bless this ministry god will bless you why because the bible says it and we are really using the finances to take this ministry forward and to speak to more people we, our name is theonos which means the mind of god and we are really focused on the mind the emotions on calling many of those things so um, when you guys support us you are helping us to get that message out and i want you to do it prayerfully i'm not saying i'm not saying do it out of law i am saying do everything prayerfully you will hear in this series that we're really going to speak a lot about walking with god and walking in obedience okay so that's one thing that i really really believe in i don't believe we serve god from an external law I believe we serve God in obedience. So if you want to contribute, our banking details will be on the screen. Our net bank banking details for all the South Africans and for all the international givers. Um, you will have our, what's it called again? Pay? Pay PayPal. PayPal. <laughs> Sounds like a command. <laughs> PayPal. Um, you can like, you can subscribe, you can ring the bell, you can comment, and all of those things helps us with our algorithm now with any further ado let's start with the message when i wake into eternity well this message was really largely inspired by a song can i tell you that i, I love music and this message was very largely inspired by a song it's a christian song i wouldn't really call it a gospel song because it's very hard rock um but it's a band called disciple and this is what the what the lead singer kevin young said in the song i'm going to read you lyrics from a song if you ever want to listen to the to the song um it's called eternity from a band called disciple this is the lyrics it says where the desert is covered in roses where i can outshine the stars in a single day the face of god isn't hidden when i wake into eternity where the shadows are never discovered and tears are nothing more than a memory. Death isn't alive any longer when I wake into eternity. So this is going to be a series called When I Wake Into Eternity. I'm not exactly sure how long this series is going to be. But I have to say I've already prepared four parts. Like part one to four is already prepared. So it's going to be at least four parts. It's probably going to be more, but it's going to be at least four parts. Let's hope it's not 52 for the whole year, but it's going to be at least four or whatever. Maybe we should hope so. Okay. Ecclesiastes. If you have a Bible, go to Ecclesiastes. Take some notes. I want to encourage you to take notes because you cannot remember all of this great stuff. So take notes. Okay. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time and he has put eternity in their hearts he has put eternity 
in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. And I want to focus on this phrase. He has put eternity in their hearts. Everybody say eternity. eternity. Again, everybody say eternity. eternity. Everybody say heart. heart. Now, eternity is the word, is the, is the Greek word olam. Olam means, and I, I don't like the first word really a, a, a lot that describes olam. I actually disagree with the first word because the, it gives us a few words on the meaning. So the first word is long duration, but long duration indicates there's going to be an end, right? But with eternity, there's not going to be an end. So, so the other words describe it, uh, uh, describes it much better. So the word olam means, means forever. That's the one word is forever. Everlasting, continuous existence or unending future. So this word eternity indicates something that is never going to end. You know, people say life is short. Have you ever heard that phrase, life is short? Life is actually not short, if you think of it. Life is the longest thing you're ever going to do. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you, if you think of a, of a worldly sense, life is the longest thing that you're ever going to do, unless you understand eternity. Now, anything divided by infinity is zero. My math is not great. I went to a school that didn't focus that much on mathematics. <laughs> huh? They focused more on looks, so my looks are good, but my math isn't, isn't great. <laughs> we gymmed and dieted a lot. And we still do. Anyway, uh, where, where, where was I? Anything divided by infinity is zero. So if you live long, let's say you live really long, you get people, they, it's an accomplishment to get to a hundred years, right? If you hear somebody is a hundred years old, they're like, well done. You must have exercised a lot. You didn't um, eat a lot of junk food and you didn't watch uh, SABC 2. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you lived till 100 years old. But if you take 100 years and you divide it by infinity, you get zero. So think about this. Zero time impacts eternity. Zero time impacts eternity. So here's my question. If zero time impacts eternity, why are we so focused on zero time? Why, why is everything that we do today, everything that we're so focused on, everything that we're striving for, everything that we're running after, everything that we get intense about, zero time. You can, have a, you can have a family member that lived 110 years old compared to eternity, it's zero time. <laughs> what are you doing with your zero time? <laughs> now, we know time is not actually zero. We know we, we have at least a few years on planet Earth. But compared to eternity, it's nothing. When I wake into eternity, it's not a, a series about... When I die one day and go to heaven. The series when I wake into eternity is when I wake up to the realization of the importance of, it, of eternity. So this is not going to be about just, you know, when you die and go to heaven. Because that's not when you wake into eternity. When you wake into eternity is actually the day you get born again. Did you guys know that you live on Everybody say, I live, on. I live on. So this is a bottle of water for those of you guys who don't know it. <laughs> this is a bottle of water and the bottle of water is in a container. But it's not about the container. It's about what's in the container. Your body is a container for you. Your body mainly isn't you. You are a spirit. That's who you are. You have a soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And you live in a body. When you die, 
your body dies, you don't. So actually we have to rephrase when somebody passes on. We shouldn't say this person died. We can say this person's body died. But that person is taken into a new body. The Bible speaks about a resurrected body. Your person and everything about you will be with you. You're not going to float there and like, where am I now? Where do I come from? No, you're going to be in a new body. You're going to know where you are. You're going to know I'm in heaven. You're going to know I used to live on earth. You're going to know this used to be my family. You're going to know that. And when one of your friends or family members dies and they go to heaven, they're going to recognize you. They're going to say, oh yeah, you look much better. <laughs> Lost weight, yeah. <laughs> Picked up muscle. <laughs> right? So eternity doesn't start when your body dies. Eternity actually starts when you get born again. The Bible says he's placed eternity in their hearts. So can I tell you something? You're going to live forever. You're not going to die and then you're going to live forever. You're just going to switch containers. I can take this water. Does somebody has a, have a glass here? Probably not. Okay. So I can take this water and pour it into the glass. But I just put it in a different container. With this realization, why are we so focused on the, what's the opposite of permanent again? Temporary. <laughs> English is not my first language, people. The opposite of permanent is temporary. If eternity, what you do with your spirit and what you do with your soul, if that's eternal, why are we so focused on what satisfies the temporal? Because this body of mine is eventually going to die. I might live until I'm 200. I probably won't, but... <laughs> but even if I do, this thing is eventually going to die. This is, this is one road we, we, we are all going to walk. <laughs> Good news. <laughs> But here's the real good news. Who I am is going to be placed in a different body, in a resurrected body. The Bible says that. So in heaven, in eternity, we are all still going to be in a body. It's like right, Pastor Gerard. I smile so she can explain. So the word eternity means everlasting. The word heart. So the Bible says he put, he placed eternity in their hearts, right? The word hearts is the word levav, levav, which means your inner part, your midst, or your core. I can say core. I have a French Bible and the French word there for heart is cœur. And cœur directly translated to English is core. So when he speaks about he placed eternity in your heart, he doesn't say he placed eternity in the thing that pumps blood through your body. He placed eternity in your core, in your inner being. That's why I cannot explain eternity to you. <laughs> I need eight sessions to not explain eternity to you. No, I'm just kidding. I cannot explain eternity to you, but you can grasp eternity in your heart, right? If I speak about eternity to a born-again Christian, you cannot explain it, but in your heart you kind of grasp it. God put it there. In your heart, you know I'm going to live forever. This body isn't, but I am. Uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who was a, a theologian, a writer, a philosopher, and a physician, in the 1900s, in the 1900s, they didn't have TV and so, so they could study a lot. <laughs> now we have one degree. <laughs> so Dr. Albert Schweitzer said, what is wrong with people is that they simply don't think. <laughs> we simply don't think. Right? I'm doing this. 
I wake up every morning, seven o'clock, shower, climb in my car, driving to a place I'm doing this, but I don't really think about why. I don't really think, think further than so that I can have a, uh, something to buy takeaways with tonight. We don't sit and think, right? Why, why are you here tonight? Have you, have, you ever, have, you, have, you, have you ever wondered about that? Why are you here tonight? Ah, well, he invited me. <laughs> My spouse is going, so... I can say spouse because nobody here is married, so nobody can say he's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, give it time. <laughs> <laughs> no, meaning like he's getting married on Saturday, right? I'm marrying you, I have to know that, sorry. <laughs> The problem with people today is that they simply don't think. Sit down and think not just what I'm doing, but why am I actually doing this? Dr. Darius Daniels, who's the, who's the pastor of Change Church, and they have multiple campuses in the USA, he said the following thing. If you, if you get this, this can save your life, okay? This, this, is, this is such a good quote. I'm going to use this quote for the rest of my life, okay? Every, even Saturday. Saturday, I'm going to use this quote. This is what your whole wedding is going to be about, <laughs> because this quote just took my breath away. Like that song who sings that, take my breath away. I know, what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking, I should have become a singer. This is my calling, I cannot do that, okay? So this is the quote from Dr. Darius Daniels. This is going to blow your mind if you get this. He said, just because a good person gives you advice, doesn't mean it's good advice. Therefore, do not ask if the person is good, ask if the advice is good. Can I tell you something? Sometimes good people will give you very bad advice. <laughs> oh, it's a good person. Let's listen to them. They have such a good heart. I'm glad they have a good heart. But is the advice good? <gasps> oh, I love this quote. So, do you ever think about why you are doing something? Remember what... what uh, Dr. Albert said, such a beautiful, beautiful name. All the clever people, <laughs> Albert Schweitzer, Albert Einstein, Albert Villa, all these like geniuses. <laughs> I have the name Albert. <laughs> so do you ever think about why you are doing something? Because if you don't really know why you are doing something, can I tell you why I'm so passionate about what I'm doing? Can I tell you why I'm so diligent about what I'm doing? Because I know what I'm doing has eternal value. Psalm 90 verse 12 and 17. I'm not going to read 217 because I only have 45 minutes. Um, long ago, people had a longer attention span. Now it's 45 minutes. With everything. Psalm 90 verse 12. Teach us to realize the brevity of life. Teach us how brief life is. This, this is what he says. Don't teach me. I think Moses wrote this. It's Moses or David, one of the two. He didn't say, teach me how to become extremely successful in life. And you can do that. I'm, for, I'm actually going to teach about that. Right? Part of my eternity session is you should become successful so that you can have influence. Right? You should make money. I'm actually going to do it in a session. You should make money so that you can help people. You, know, you shouldn't make money just so that you can be nice about yourself. You should make money so that you can use your money for the good. You should. Not it's a good idea. You should. Like, I'm going to literally prove it to you out of the Bible. Okay? Not it's a good idea. You should. <laughs> um, teach us to realize the brevity of life. Listen. You know the thing that you are so worried about? You know the thing that you are so, so, so worried and stressed out about and freaking out about? It's brevity. Do you know what brevity means? It means this. Compared to eternity. The thing that you are so freaking out about, here it is. Brevity. Do you know what the Bible says? It says, teach us to see everything we are so freaked out about as so that we can focus on eternity. <laughs> so that we may know so that we may grow in wisdom 
Who of you want to become more wise? All of you, wow. I'll teach you. This is why the Bible says you become wise. Do this and grow in wisdom. See everything that you think is so important as that. Then you'll become wise. Because you know what? Then you're going to focus on the importance of eternity. And not focus on the importance of everything that the Bible calls brevity. And may the Lord God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. You know what he says? This thing that you are so worried about, this that you are so worried about, he says, see this as brevity, focus on eternity, and he will make this successful. <laughs> Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and I will add things unto you. It's a scripture in Haggai, where, where Haggai is saying, my house is lying in ruins. And you know what God says to him? God says to him, your house is in ruins because you're trying to build it. I'm like, whoa, this doesn't make sense. I'm trying to build it. That's why it lies in ruins. He says, yeah, start building my house and I'll build, and I'll build yours. <laughs> you know how most people do their Christianity? And that's why it doesn't work for them. I've tried it. It doesn't work. Because God, this is what I'm going to do. Please come here and come do all crazy things to help me. Uh, God says, no. Eternity, let's focus there. I'll take care of this. It's not a big deal. Let's focus on eternity. Now, Jesus, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is what they call the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' most famous sermon that he's ever preached. If you want to go read, you can go read Jesus' most famous sermon that he's ever preached. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. You will see if you, if you, if you, if you have a new modern King, J King James version of the Bible, I think the NIV and some of the other Bibles also does it. They put Jesus' words in red. Do you, do you have the Bible that put Jesus' words in red? Now, if you have a Bible that put Jesus' words in red, you will see Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7 is red. Everything is red. Because it's one session Jesus was preaching. So what happened is Jesus got, he got baptized. Then he went to the wilderness to be, to, be, to be tempted by the devil or tested by the devil for 40 days. And after that, he, he, he came out of that with so much power. He started healing people. He started freeing people. He did miracles all over Galilee. Next to, next to the Sea of Galilee and in Galilee, he was doing like all these miracles and people just started flocking to him. And thousands of people came to see what he was doing and then he went up on this mountain and then he preached this famous sermon that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And the main theme of the Sermon on the Mount was to get people to stop focusing on the external law and to get them to focus on the relationship with him. And he, will, he was trying to tell people, your law, your religion, your tradition isn't going to help you. That was the main theme of the Sermon on the Mount. And on the Sermon on the Mount, he was quoting from something called the Talmud. And the Pharisees got so angry because for you to become a Pharisee, it's difficult. Not a lot of people went all the way to become a Pharisee. One of the greatest, greatest... Um, achievements in the biblical times was to become a Pharisee. If you say this person is a Pharisee, one of the highest titles you could ever get. A Pharisee from age five or six, they had to study um, the Torah. The Torah was the first five books of the Bible. Not only did they have to study the Torah, they had to quote the Torah front to back. If you take a seven-year-old kid that's studying to become a Pharisee and that kid cannot quote the Torah, you're out. And when you're 10 years old, I think it's when you're 10 years old, between 5 and 10, you had to quote the Torah. If you couldn't quote the Torah by 10 years old, you're out. And then if you, if you, if you, if you succeeded, now you had to learn the Talmud. The Talmud was the 600 and something Jewish laws. Now you had to read the 600 and, and your goal as, as, as a, your whole being as a Pharisee, 
is to teach God's laws to the people and make sure they keep God's laws. That's the Talmud. You, if you become a Pharisee now, after I think you, from age 10 to 17, you have to do that. Then you, then you become kind of like a rabbi, but you have to study under a rabbi then. You have to study under a rabbi, and if, you, and if you get through that, you become a Pharisee. Not a lot of people got there. And if you're a Pharisee, your goal is to get everybody to obey the Torah and to obey the Talmud. If you break the Torah, break the Talmud, then then you're gone, gone, then there's punishment for you because then you break God's laws. And here this guy, Jesus, comes on the scene and he claims to be the son of God. But there's a problem. He claims to be the son of God, but he's breaking the Talmud. This guy eats pork, he, eats, he, he, he heals people on the Sabbath, he sits with sinners. He does everything that the Talmud tells him not to do. And now on the Sermon on the Mount, he's quoting out of the Talmud. He says, you say, every single time on the Sermon on the Mount, when he says, you say, he's quoting the Talmud. He says, you say, but I say. You say, but I say. The Pharisees got extremely angry with him. Because now he's teaching them, your walk with God is not about an external law anymore. It's about an internal walk with me. Matthew 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, you guys know, for those of you who don't, it starts with the Beatitudes, blessed are those who, blessed are those who, blessed are those who, blessed are those who. It goes to you are the salt of the earth, goes to you are the light of the world. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Then he gets to this part in Matthew 6, that's part of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says the following, listen to this. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. Meaning everything that you built for yourselves on earth can be lost. He says, don't do that. Don't, don't focus on building for yourselves treasures on earth. He says, where moth and rust destroys, where thieves break in and steal. But listen to this. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will also be. You know what he's saying? He's saying it's possible to lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. But he's also saying it's possible to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So what he's talking about, and we're going to get into this in one of the sessions, is in heaven, there will be rewards. You will be rewarded in heaven. Not everybody, but there will be rewards in heaven. Albert, are you saying that some people will go to heaven but not get rewarded? Yes, I'm going to prove it to you. And here's the thing, God wants to reward us. He's teaching us these things and he's saying to them, listen, you're not going to be rewarded by following an external law. You are not going to be rewarded by following the Talmud. You are going to be rewarded by following me and being obedient to me. John Bevere said it like this. He said, you will not be rewarded on what you did but you will be rewarded in doing what you were called to do. So this is not about let's do a bunch of stuff so that God can reward me. No, 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 no. It's about called, not about do. It's not about works. It's about walking with him. So he can call one person to have a church of 100,000 people and he can call another person to be a housewife and if this person had the church of 100,000 people and this person was the housewife, both of them will receive a full reward because they did what they were called to do. Don't try to start a ministry if that's not what you were called to do. Because every single person will impact eternity if they do what God says they must do. That's why I say to people, don't be a part of the owners if it's not what you're called to do. 
Don't give a cent if it's not what you're called to do. But if God tells you to do it, don't hesitate to do it. Because our biggest rewards, I believe in rewards on earth as well. Please get me right. But our biggest rewards will be in heaven. So don't focus on giving, serving, obeying just to get an earthly reward. Because I can prove to you in the Bible there are people who obeyed God and they got beheaded. <laughs> there are people who obeyed God and they lost their jobs. In the Bible, did you, did you guys know people were actually persecuted in the Bible? <laughs> For doing the right thing. On earth it looked like, wow, bad move, dude. John the Baptist, who according to the Bible was the greatest prophet who ever lived, his whole destiny was planned out. He started his ministry, he started in walking in obedience with God. Six months later, he was beheaded because he did what God told him to do. Now, by this, I am saying I do believe on treasures on earth. I believe, obey God and he's going to do great things for you on earth. I believe in that. But too many people are focused on that because I can promise you John the Baptist has an amazing reward in heaven. People who were persecuted and killed for the gospel had, has an amazing reward in heaven. Oh, when I wake into eternity, when I wake up to the realization that everything is about eternity. Listen, I want you guys to be extremely successful for eternity's sake. Because you know what? The poor cannot help the poor. Many people will say, I've heard many people, you know, I want to help poor people. I want to give. I want to give to ministries. Are you giving right now? Yeah, but I cannot give a lot right now. I can only give a thousand rand right now. But are you giving that? Because the Bible says if you are faithful with the least, you will be, ro you will be ruler over much. God tests you with the difficult. God tests you when you don't have a lot of time. Many a times I see this. As soon as God answers prayer, people, people, people pull back. People pray for a business until they get the business, then they're too busy to serve God. Because, because you are so focused on earth that you've lost the perspective of eternity. So many people pray for a spouse and as soon as they get the spouse, they don't serve God anymore. So many people pr pray for a kid and when they get a kid, I'm not going to serve God anymore. The kid takes too much of my time. You want to you wanna make 100% sure your kid rebels? Make that kid God. Make, the, make your kid God in your life 100% that kid is going to rebel. Let your kid be your leader. 100% your, that kid is going to rebel. Because that's not how God created it. <sighs> right? Many parents today, like, my kid decides what I'm going to do. My kid is rebelling. Take leadership. You are the leader of that kid. Right? If you're a man, bust him in a laster. If you're a man and you get married, you are the leader of that household. Not the dominator, please get me right. Because we are not called to dominate people. But you are the leader. Because we are focusing and we are living for eternity. So do not gather for yourselves treasures on earth. Gather for yourselves treasures in heaven. Don't worry so much about the result. Worry more about what God wants you to do. Not worry, but focus. That's the word. Focus on what God wants you to do. Don't focus so much on the result. The Bible says further in Matthew 6, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Note what it doesn't say. It doesn't say where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Put your treasure in earthly things, your heart will be on earthly things. Put your treasure in eternity, and your heart will be in eternity. 
what's your treasure? Your treasure is three things, or three things. One of those two. <laughs> <laughs> it's your time, it's your money, and it's your gift or your talent. So he says, use your time, use your money, use your gift for eternity's sake. That doesn't mean hang out in church the whole day. Please don't. It does mean do those things to fulfill what I've called you to do. That's how you focus on eternity. Why am I here? Right. Thor went to earth for a, like he was, he was, he, he, he was from Asgard, but he went to earth for, for a reason. <laughs> I actually kicked him out, but you guys, you guys get what I'm trying to say. So the Bible says we are not from here. We are here to accomplish something for the kingdom of God, but we are not from here. So the Bible encourages us to wake into the realization of eternity. Psalm 37 verse 18, the Bible says, Day by day the Lord takes care of the innocent, and they will receive an inheritance. Everybody, that's, everybody say inheritance. inheritance. You know, if both your parents die, you get an inheritance. But that inheritance still doesn't last forever, because eventually you're going to die. <laughs> Listen to what the Bible says. It says, they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. That word forever shows me that it's not talking about earth. Because no matter what I give to you on earth, it's not forever. Because your body is not forever. You are, but your earthly body isn't. Listen, you can go to heaven any day now. Jesus can come back right now. Something might happen to your life. I'm not prophesying it. I'm just saying it can. Are you at a place where you say, listen, but even if, it do, even if, he, even if he comes back, even if something would happen to me today, not just I have the confidence that I'm born again, but I have the confidence that I'm going to stand before him. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I asked you to do. Receive your rewards. I want to hear that. I really want to hear that. Rollo May, a psychologist and author in the 1900s, said the opposite of courage is not cowardice, it's conformity. So he says, you, you are a coward if you just do what everybody else is doing. Dr. Darius Daniels also said the following. Wow, I love that guy. He also said the following. He said, if you want to become successful, look at what most people are doing and don't do that. <laughs> the, opposite, the opposite of courage is not cowardness, it's conformity. Just doing what everybody else is doing and becoming like everybody else is becoming. That is how you step away from your eternal rewards and treasures. Just do what everybody else is doing. Just follow the flow. And listen, just because somebody is a Christian doesn't mean they're right. Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor, said, a man's life is what his thoughts make of it. When you wake up in the morning, what is your first thought? Is your first thought, I have to go do this for eternity's sake? Or is your first thought, oh, I have to go do this again? This is how you know. Okay, so many people are going to say, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm in my calling. And I'm going to do a session about calling. Maybe a few sessions about how to find out what your calling is. But this is how you, don't, this is how you know you're not in your calling. When you wake up with, oh. God didn't create you for that. God didn't create you so that your alarm clock can go off in the morning and you can go, oh, yeah. now I have to go again. If you have a thank God, it's Friday mentality, you're not in your calling. <laughs> because nobody who's in their calling say, thank God, now I don't have to do what God wants me to do. I'm for a break. Like, please get me right. I'm for taking the weekend off. I'm for a break. I'm for all those things. I take breaks as well. But God didn't create you to live a life where you hate your job, hate your marriage, hate everything around you. God didn't create you for a life like that. Can we be honest? And God didn't create it like, just hold on until Jesus comes back. 
Some people are like, all the signs are here for the end times. And they are, like I'm not saying they're not, but many people are like, all the signs are here for the end times. We must now just hold on until Jesus comes back. That's dumb. Because he, he hasn't come back yet. If I'm 100% sure he's coming back tonight, 10 o'clock, I'm going to do what I need to do, what he's called me to do between now and 10 o'clock tonight. I'm not going to be always coming back. <laughs> Machachos one last time. <laughs> <laughs> Right. you're in your calling maybe you know maybe you might be in your calling with a bad attitude maybe that's also a thing but you but when you're in your calling you wake up and say today i'm going to do what god has called me to do because it has eternal value and i love it the bible says in second john one let me just say before i read second john one i'm almost done i know we, we're, we're, we're out of time um like the prophet mick jagger said but let me <laughs> just give me a few more minutes okay so second john and third john was written by the apostle john okay so you get the apostle john and you get john the baptist but john the baptist like he was there for six months so he didn't really write anything <laughs> okay <laughs> but so the the, the 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 apostle john was seen in the bible as one of the people who, who's preaching and teaching had the perfect combination between love and truth now you get people who speak love, you know, they make you feel good about yourself, they speak love, but they don't speak truth. Then you get people who speak, who speaks a harsh, a harsh truth, but they don't have love. And the Bible teaches we should have a perfect combination between the two. We should speak the truth out of a place of love. Right? So here John writes in John 2, 2 John and 3 John. Now, just to give you some background about what the book of John is all about. The book of John, or not, not, not the book of John, sorry, 2nd John and 3rd John. What it's about is hospitality. Those two books, is, they're all about hospitality because what happened is they had local ministers that we still have today, which is good. Local ministers means I have a church in a city and I stay put. Then, I, then they have traveling ministers. Traveling ministers are people that they don't stay put. They travel all the, all the way. They, they, they fly the whole world. No, well, in that time, it was more camels than donkeys. <laughs> yeah, donkey, donkey. <laughs> so, um, so they're traveling ministers, and the, and the people had to host the traveling ministers. Now, in Second John, there was a woman, and she showed too much love, but she didn't show a lot of truth. Me meaning, she just welcomed any preacher. Anybody like, I'm a preacher. Oh, come in, come preach at my church. She was like that. Come stay at my house, preach at my church. You're a preacher, let's do it. But the problem was she invited a lot of preachers who spoke a bunch of nonsense, unfortunately. Then you got the guy in 3 John, and he was more on the truth side, but he didn't have love. So good preachers would, would come to him, and he would say, no, I will preach. Don't worry, you guys are just talking a bunch of rubbish. So the, one per, the person in, in 2 John went so much to the love side that, they, that, that, that she didn't allow any truth, or she didn't really focus on truth, where this person in, in 3 John focused so much on truth, but not out of love. So in 2 John, John is writing to this woman, and he's saying to this woman, be careful to invite all of these people, because a bunch of them are talking nonsense. <laughs> Listen to what he said in 2 John 1 verse 8. He says, look to yourself that you do not lose the things you've worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. See, so you know what he's saying? He's saying, be careful that the people don't teach you wrong, because if you teach you, they teach you wrong, you are going to lose your reward. You know what that says? You believing a false teaching is not going to excuse you. You cannot say, but I was taught wrong. He says, if, if they teach the people wrong and the people believe wrong, they're not going to get their full reward. <laughs> so be careful for the wrong teaching because the wrong teaching can cause you to, to not to get the reward that God wants, wants you to get. Now listen, many people will say, Albert, I know what you're saying, but rewards aren't important. We don't live for rewards. You know, it's not like we're not serving God for rewards. We're serving God to be close to him. We're serving God for relationship with Him. That's why we're serving God. Let me ask this question. There were two people in the Bible who was the closest to Jesus. Who was that? 
The first one, Mary Magdalene. Second one, John the Apostle. The closest to Jesus. Meaning those are the people he allowed the closest to him. Out of the 12 disciples, he had three close to him, Peter, James, and John. So he took Peter, James, and John to certain places because they were, they were the closest to, to him. But there's one that he singled out, and that was John. There are some places he only took John. That's how close they were. Like, I cannot take the other ones. I can only take John. John was the person. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, his brothers were there. James and Jude were there. Why is that important? Because he looked to John and said to John, take care of my mother. He didn't look to James and, Ju and, and Jude. Who was his blood brothers? He said to John, take care of my mother. That's how, how close he was to John. The disciple or the apostle at this time who was the closest to Jesus writes this. Run in such a way that you don't lose what you've worked for, but that you receive a full reward. The closest person to Jesus wrote that. Therefore, a person cannot say, let's just focus on being close to Jesus. Let's not focus on our rewards. Listen to what John said, the person who was the closest to Jesus. Reward, there is the Greek word mistos, which means dues paid for work or rewards which, rewards which God bestows or will bestow upon good deeds or good endeavors. Now, I'm done. Okay, I'm done. Play the music we're going to play. We're going to pray. One more scripture. We are sons of Abram. The Bible says we are sons of Abram. The blessing and the promise that's on Abram is upon us. Now let's see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you in our last scripture tonight how God introduced himself to Abram. Here's how God introduces himself to Abram. He says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. Shield, I will protect you and reward, I will, I will reward you. He introduces himself to Abram, the father of faith, for the first time as a rewarder. That's Genesis 15 verse 1. Listen, God loves to and wants to reward you. God wants to see you in heaven one day. He wants to look at your face and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to reward you for what you've done on planet earth. You did what I've called you to do. Don't do what God hasn't called you to do. And don't compete. God is not going to look at who did the most. God is going to look at who did what he asked them to do. And you're sitting there and you're saying, but how do I know what he asked me to do? How do I hear his voice? How do I know his will? How do I know my calling? Come back for part two, three, and four. Somewhere in there, I will answer you. But I want to speak to people today who are, who, are, who are watching this and they say, listen, I don't even know if I'm born again yet. I cannot honestly say if I die, I will even go to heaven because only relationship with Christ, only giving your life to Christ will do that. So if you are watching, um, I want to encourage you. If you, if, if you are that person that says, listen, I need to give my life back to Jesus Christ. I just want you to put your hand on your heart just as an indication. Say, that's me. I want to give my life back to Jesus Christ. And then pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, today I acknowledge I cannot save myself. I need a Savior. I ask you now to save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, for every single believer, I want to encourage you. Take this message. Take this message seriously. Watch the other messages because this is going to encourage you to become the person that God has called you to be so that you can receive a retur a, a, an eternal reward. And I want to encourage you with your participation in Theonos, I want you to participate as God calls you. I, I always say one thing that gets me really angry is when people told me this is what I'm going to do or this is what God told me to do and they don't do that. The Bible says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. I cannot tell you how many people, I've had people that sat with me and said to me, God sent you on my road because I have to get involved with you. That hasn't been here once. And I'm okay if you don't come. I'm like, like I don't want to come. This is not my calling. Great, then don't. 
But I'm asking you if God called you to help this ministry, to be here with us, to sow into our lives, I want you to obey God. To bring people to, 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 to do what you have to do. I don't want you to do anything that God hasn't called you to do. But if you are listening, if you are here or if you are listening, and God says you must get involved with us, be involved as He calls you. Because I know He will reward you on earth and in heaven. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you. I'll see you again next week. Goodbye.